So what we're working on here is uh, we've learned uh, how to draw resonance structures and we were looking at uh, then uh, how to use resonance to explain stuff in organic chemistry. So we were trying to go over what are the topics in organic chemistry that involve uh, resonance and then we've seen a few of them. Uh, so uh, let's continue uh, trying to apply that information. So let's start with this. Okay. What role would you expect this molecule to play in a reaction? Um, it would. It could be a poor nucleophile. Um, perhaps even a poor base or a weak base. I guess you could say. What makes you think that it would be a reasonable nucleophile? Or why is it a reasonable nucleophile? The pi bonds, carbon-carbon pi bonds. Okay, good. That's right. However, how did you know it's a poor nucleophile? Well, that's simply something we've talked about in the past. What's the name of this yeah. molecule? Benzene. That's right. This is called uh, benzene. Now, this is a second semester topic, so you probably didn't see this in your first semester course, but you, I've mentioned to you briefly, benzene has a special property. Benzene is called aromatic. Um, okay. is benzene, does benzene start as a stable or unstable molecule? Stable. Aromatic molecules are particularly stable. Uh, molecules that have this property of being aromatic are particularly stable. Um, this is what, uh, aromatic is a property of some conjugated rings. You're going to study that in the second semester, how to tell if something's aromatic, but some conjugated rings are aromatic. Um, where aromatic here doesn't have anything to do with their smell, it just means that they uh, are particularly stable. Would that make the benzene more reactive or more unreactive? Unreactive. Unreactive. Good. That's why it's only a poor nucleophile. Okay. Uh, theoretically, we might expect it to be a weak base because of the carbon-carbon uh, pi bonds. However, it turns out that there aren't any, I don't think, any interesting reactions you'll study where it's a weak base. So even though that fits in with our rules, I'll erase that. Um, okay. okay. So uh, let's see. We'll just look at uh, how benzene acts as a uh, nucleophile. Okay. Okay, so now let's try to predict the reactivity of this molecule. Why don't you copy this onto your screen? Okay. Okay, and now let's try to predict, what, what could you predict about the reactivity of this molecule? Um, it looks like... Um, carbons 2, 4, and 6 would be nucleophilic um, because uh, resonance with that oxygen. Um, that oxygen, uh, they would all have hidden negative charges. And the oxygen would have a hidden positive charge. Um, which could make it acidic, an, an acidic oxygen. That's a very good analysis. Excellent. That's very good. There was a bunch of things that were good about that. One thing is that you specifically saw which carbons would be uh, nucleophilic. And also, it's good that you thought about what would happen to the oxygen, and you saw that the oxygen would be acidic. That, that's, a, that's a good catch there. Um, okay, that's great that you can do that in your head. Uh, since we're working on resonance for practice, let's go ahead and draw the resonance structures you were talking about. So let's go ahead and draw the resonance structures you were talking about, but your, the, the, the verbal description you gave was, was correct. Okay.
Okay, excellent. We can stop right there. You're right okay. that there's one more resonance structure. You're right there's one more resonance structure. If the assignment was to draw all the possible resonance structures, you're right that there's one more. Um, but now we're moving into just using resonance to predict reactivity. And that last, that, that last resonance structure you were going to draw isn't going to give us any new reactivity. So we'll save a couple seconds and leave that out. Wouldn't be wrong to write that down. We'll just save a second and leave that out because now we're focusing on how resonance uh, affects reactivity. And this just confirms what you'd already said to me. Carbons 2, 4, and 6 are nucleophilic because they have the negative charge in various resonance structures. Okay. Um, so it looks like we're predicting, uh, let's see. Um, and it's also good that you noticed that the oxygen here would be acidic. That's an excellent point. Good. Um, so uh, that, that positive charge, even without a charge, you might expect the oxygen to be weakly acidic. Uh, but that positive charge is going to make the oxygen uh, more acidic than before. So that's an important point uh, that you were making. Or 2, 4, or 6 could act as uh, nucleophiles. Okay. Good. Yeah. Now, we said that regular benzene was a poor nucleophile. We said regular benzene was a poor nucleophile. Would we expect this benzene to be a better or worse nucleophile than regular benzene? A better nucleophile. Because of the negative charges. Good. Yeah. So would we say that benzene here has been activated or deactivated as a nucleophile? Um, activated. Yeah. I haven't defined that term, but you figured out what I meant. Um, so this substituent here is what's called a uh, activator for benzene to act like a nucleophile. Um, this is one of the early topics that studied in the second semester. Uh, one of the two main molecules in the second semester is benzene, one of the two main types of functional groups. And one of the main things you study is the effect of substituents on benzenes, the effect of substituents on benzenes. So this substituent activates benzene as a nucleophile. You probably don't want to just say it activates benzene. You might not want to say it just activates benzene because it, it doesn't activate benzene as an electrophile. It activates it as a nucleophile. Uh, it would make benzene into a worse electrophile. It already wasn't that great, and now it's an even worse electrophile than before. But we could say it activates it as a uh, nucleophile. So we could say it's an activator for benzene um, okay. as a nucleophile. Um, now, maybe I'll go back to my screen. In this molecule, all the carbons were equivalent. Here, all the carbons are equivalent. But how about in this molecule? Is carbon 2 and 3 equivalent in this molecule? Uh, no, they're not. So it would help to have names for them. Um, I don't know, have you, uh, you might not have ever seen this before. Do you know what the names are for carbons 2, 3, and 4 in this benzene? Um, are they like alpha carbons and that, beta? That actually would be very logical. That would be uh, very logical, although in that case you might call this alpha. You would say that carbon 1 is alpha to the oxygen. Okay. Alpha to the oxygen means you're right next to the oxygen, and carbon two would be beta to the oxygen. Um, so that would be a that would be a good naming system. However, that turns out there's a different system that's used for benzene. So carbon two is called the ortho position. Okay, that's right. And you've heard those terms before? Um, yeah, I did hear them before. I think okay. we mentioned them, or maybe I mentioned them before. All right. Anyway, this is a, a topic that uh, is important in second semester. So then carbon three is called meta. Carbon 4 is called para. I don't know any logic or rhyme or reason to those names, but those are just the names. Ortho, meta, and para. There probably is some reasoning behind it. Um, what do you think would be a good name for carbon 5? Um, meta. Good. That's good that you saw we don't need a new name. It's equivalent to carbon 3. Yeah. And carbon 6? Ortho. So you might notice there's only one para. So a uh, para does not come in a pair, but the other ones do come in pairs. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, okay, so those are just some made-up names to refer to the different carbons in benzene when there's one substituent. When there's one substituent in benzene, you can use, uh, you can use these terms uh, for the atoms that are uh, in these positions. Okay, let's see, what was I going to say? Maybe I'll mention... Carbon 1 is called ipso. 
There's only one ipsa. So that's the carbon right next to the substituent. So when we have this OH group, does the, which, this OH group makes which carbons nucleophilic? Um, it makes the ortho and para nucleophilic. So the OH group is called an ortho para director. Okay. This is an ortho para director. for a nucleophilic reaction. For benzene to act as a nucleophile. So that's some terminology that's, uh, that's studied when benzene is studied in the second semester. So we're just now just starting to get a head start on some of the topics from the second semester that we can now understand using our tools so we would say this OH group is a uh, activator and an ortho para director for benzene to act as a nucleophile. It's an activator because it makes it easier for benzene to act as a nucleophile. It's an ortho para director because it specifically makes 2, 6, and 4 nucleophilic. Okay. Okay, good. Let's see. So, what type of substituent was this OH group relative to the benzene? Was this OH group electron donating or electron withdrawing? Donating. So that seems to be, um, I'm not sure if that would be a relative thing. I'm, it, it doesn't seem like oxygen would always be electron donating, but perhaps only in certain situations. Why do you say that? Um, like, uh, it, it seems that oxygen is more, hmm, I may be confusing terms, but in like a, a ketone, carbonyl, um, seems that it would not be electron donating the oxygen. I guess it's not an alcohol, but um, I guess would oxygen always be an electron, or I guess uh, would alcohol always be an electron donating substituent, or is it unique to benzene? That's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, so you asked a good question. You asked a good question, and you, um, you haven't quite come up with your answer to it, but you asked a good question. Well, um, is there any reason why you would expect oxygen to be electron withdrawing? Um, I guess I'm not quite sure what makes them donating and withdrawing. Um, if it had a pi bond, an oxygen with a pi bond to a carbon, it seems like it would be more withdrawing than donating. Um, Why? Um, How so? Just uh, from our resonance, it, it seems to take that pi bond and, con and take the electron pair to itself. Um, Excellent. Okay, that's right. So we haven't quite clarified the whole issue here, but one thing you saw is, is in this case, the oxygen is called electron donating by resonance. We would say this oxygen is electron donating by resonance. Okay. But what you just pointed out, is so kind of what you were asking is, is oxygen always electron donating by resonance? And the answer is no. You, you just thought of a situation where an oxygen would be electron withdrawing. By resonance. So that's an excellent point. So, uh, so the point you made is a good one. Are oxygens always electron donating by resonance? No. Depending on the situation, oxygens can either be electron donating or electron withdrawing by resonance. Uh, so it's good that you saw the distinction between those. Okay. Okay. Um, we could have said a little bit more though. 
Um, actually, most people, I think, would usually expect oxygens to be electron withdrawing because of their electronegativity. That was the one thing you hadn't mentioned that I was kind of hoping that you would mention, is oxygen have a high or a low electronegativity. It has a high one. I was thinking of mentioning that, but I was afraid I was blurring between two separate ideas. I'm not sure how they relate to each other exactly. But. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, let's clarify that. So oxygen does have high electronegativity. Would that make an electron donating or withdrawing? Probably withdrawing. The high electronegativity of oxygen tends to make an electron withdrawing. And the name for that phenomenon is one that I don't think you and I have talked about. That's called by induction. When an oxygen, okay. oxygen withdraws electrons by electronegativity, that's called electron withdrawing by induction. Okay. Okay, so we were struggling to clarify there a second ago. You, you said you, you thought there were maybe two issues and you didn't want to confuse them. And in a sense, that's right. There's two different phenomena here. Because of its electronegativity, oxygen tends to be electron withdrawing, and that ph phenomenon is called induction. But by resonance, oxygens can be either electron donating or electron withdrawing, depending on their position in the molecule. So okay. that's the phenomenon called resonance. So we have two different phenomena, induction and resonance. We've been focusing on resonance, but it's worthwhile to talk about induction. Even though the term induction is oftentimes not used too much in the first semester, or maybe sometimes it is, people certainly talk about electronegativity in the first semester. Sure. Now, obviously, if the oxygen is electron withdrawing by induction, and it's also electron withdrawing by resonance, then it's pretty clear that overall the oxygen will be electron withdrawing. But yeah. do you see there's the potential for a conflict or a contradiction here? Because what if the oxygen is electron withdrawing by induction, but what if it's also electron donating by resonance? Who wins? Uh, well, you tell me. Um, if you had to take a guess, if there's a conflict by, between induction and resonance, who would generally win? Um, I'd probably say resonance. It seems that the the induction illustrates the reasoning why we had the delta positive delta negative charges, and um, it seems like the resonance shows hidden positive or hidden negative charges, and perhaps those would be Mm, better um, nucleophiles or electrophiles, whatever, than the, just the partial positive, partial negative. That's a good argument. That's okay, good. Yes, so that, that's a good way to put it. It's good that you notice that the induction is kind of what sets up what we usually label as delta positive or delta negative. Now, um, you tried to kind of figure out which of these would be stronger. I'm not sure if it's something you could actually figure out just from theory. 
Um, however, it turns out that in practice, by experiment, what you said was correct. Resonance does is more important than induction. Generally speaking, if there's a conflict between resonance and another phenomenon, resonance usually wins, uh, okay. at least in the examples you're going to see in your course. So in the first semester course, if there's a conflict between resonance and something else, it's the resonance that usually dominates. That's why I kind of expected you to answer that, because that's something I had mentioned once or twice before. I said how resonance trumps other, other ideas. Resonance okay. tends to be more important than the other ideas that it might be in conflict with. And that, that was kind of what you were getting at before. So you, what you said was correct. Resonance okay. turns out to be more important than electronegativity. Um, and we can kind of just remember that. At, I don't know if it makes perfect sense theoretically, but we can remember that because uh, resonance uh, reveals full formal charges on certain atoms. Uh, I don't know. Theoretically, that's not quite right because remember the true charge is a blend of the non-charged and the charged picture. Uh, but, but in any case, it, it still works. It still gives the right answer. So what you said is the right answer. Resonance tends to be more important than uh, induction if there's a conflict. After all, in this case, you might expect the oxygen to be withdrawing electrons from the ring by induction. Um, yeah. But what's more important is that it's donating by resonance. That's why overall this is considered an electron donating substituent in this case. Okay. Okay. So if there's a conflict between induction and resonance, who usually wins? Resonance. Good. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, going back, you originally asked me the question, is oxygen always electron withdrawing? Is oxygen always electron withdrawing? That was a good question, and now we've kind of answered it. Um, oxygen, um, it's actually kind of complicated. By induction, oxygen is always electron withdrawing. But, oh no, actually I guess the question you asked me was whether oxygen was always electron donating, because this was an example where oxygen was electron donating. And yeah. you asked if it is oxygen always electron donating. And we saw it's complicated, Actually, by induction, oxygen is always electron withdrawing, but sometimes that's trumped or beaten by the resonance effect. On the other hand, sometimes resonance would make oxygen electron withdrawing as well, and sometimes there is no resonance. Okay. What role do you expect this molecule to play in a reaction? Um, an electrophile. Which atom will be electrophilic? Either carbon one or two. And it has a, that's through induction, it has, a, they each have a delta positive charge. Excellent. Good. So I think you were seeing what my point was here. Um, what about resonance? Why doesn't resonance trump that? There is no resonance in that yeah. molecule. The resonance doesn't, so that's why I said here, depending on the molecule structure. Actually, I should have said, depending on the molecule structure, oxygens could be electron donating or withdrawing, or neither, by resonance, if there is no resonance. I should okay. have mentioned, if there is no resonance, then, then this uh, effect certain, uh, obviously wouldn't apply. So sure. notice, induction always applies. Oxygens always have electronegativity. Um, well, I don't know, even, even that's not quite true. If they had a positive formal charge, I guess you wouldn't say they would, they would be withdrawing by induction. No, actually, that would make them even more electron withdrawing. If they had a negative charge, maybe um, that would change this, actually. I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, all right. Even that's not quite right. All right, so forget <laughs> it. I'm, I'm making things too complicated. But anyway, my point is that resonance doesn't always apply. Um, okay. Oxygens, th this effect kind of always applies for oxygens, but this uh, resonance doesn't always apply because sometimes there is no resonance. This actually tends to confuse people quite a bit. In the first semester, we don't really actually use resonance very much. We just use electronegativity. People, people learn about resonance in the first semester, but it's not actually used in many problems. Um, instead, we just use electronegativity, so people tend to learn that oxygen would be electron withdrawing. Um, but actually, in the second semester, oxygen is often electron donating uh, because of resonance. That's the point I wanted to make. In the first semester, we would have expected oxygen to be electron withdrawing because of its electronegativity by induction. But in the, in the second semester, now we can see it can go either way, depending on the details. We ha um, whether something is electron donating or withdrawing becomes more complicated uh, than it was in the first semester. So this is, again, 
giving us um, a head start on some of the material for the second semester. In the first semester, we assume electronegative atoms are electron withdrawing by induction, but in the second semester, it's more complicated. Sometimes they could be electron donating because of resonance. So um, that's we're getting head start on that topic here. Here's an example where the oxygen turned out to be electron donating by resonance. Okay. Here's an example where it was electron withdrawing because there was no resonance. Okay. okay. So that, that's the answer to your question. You were asking, is oxygen always electron donating? And the answer is no. Here's an example where it's an electron withdrawal. Okay. okay, good. So that was a good question, and now we've clarified that. Um, by, and we've learned these two concepts of induction and resonance that can conflict with each other. Let's yeah. see. All right. Um, Let's draw this molecule on your screen. Okay. Uh, what would you predict about the reactivity for this molecule? It appears to do the same by resonance. It looks like it would also be a ortho para director an active would you say nucleophilic activator yeah maybe uh will be will uh, be even more specific it's easy to get confused here so we'll say it activates the benzene to act like a nucleophile but it's better it's better to uh, give it as a complete sentence to avoid confusion so what but i think you, you were thinking of the right thing so this activates the nucleophile this activates the benzene to act like a nucleophile Yes, activates the benzene to act like a nucleophile. Yeah. Rather than trying to use a shorthand. Although the shorthand would just be it's an activator. It's an activator. But obviously it's deactivated the benzene to act like an electrophile. True. For it we to should always draw the electron pushing arrows first before. Yeah, the sorry, <laughs> sorry, got ahead of myself there. For it to for benzene to ever act as an electrophile, you probably want or need a um, electron withdrawing group by resonance, and I think that's all the structures that really make a difference in the activity. Outstanding, excellent. Um, and that, that last comment that you just made is really an outstanding comment as well. Um, that might not seem like a big deal, but that's that's starting you're, you're starting starting to sound like an organic chemist. High praise, starting to sound like an organic chemist. So I asked you what would be the effect of this substituent on the benzene, and you said, like a good student, that that would make the benzene activated to act like a nucleophile. Uh, but but then you, you took a more you were a little more active than that. Besides just answering that question, you also asked a further question. As an organic chemist, you said, "Well, gee, if this is going to make the benzene more nucleophilic, wouldn't it be interesting to try to figure out what would make the benzene more electrophilic? Because that's that's how you get the prizes and the research grants by uh, making extensions from what you already know." So that's exactly the type of question that an organic chemist would ask themselves. They would say, if this substituent has the effect of making benzene more uh, nucleophilic, what benzene, what uh, substituent would make it more uh, electrophilic? And your answer was a very good one. An electron withdrawing substituent would make it more uh, electrophilic. Uh, so I said uh, that that would be a good way to think if you were uh, try it, uh, if you were uh, going into a career as an organic chemist. But that's also a good way to think just for your course. Uh, that that's that's the way the instructor wants to be thinking during the course. So that that's good that you're taking that extra step and trying to make that extension. That that's important. Uh, so what you said was right. Okay. So uh, in any case, going back to this example, um, you're right. This has activated. Which atoms would we expect to be nucleophilic? Um, let, if I number them here, it would be two, four, and six carbons as nucleophiles and. Um, 
nitrogen looks like it could be an acid. Good point. That charged. Yes. Um, so I guess that would be the ortho and para carbon atoms that are activated to act as nucleophiles. That's good that you use that terminology. That's right. So we would say that um, this nitrogen is an ortho para director for the benzene to act like a nucleophile. Besides activating the benzene to act like a nucleophile, it's an ortho para director for the benzene to act like a nucleophile. Good. Okay. Well, let's see. Okay, good. So it turned out to be a similar analysis to the OH group. We decided again that this was uh, activated the benzene to act as a nucleophile. And that it was a ortho para director. How about by induction? Would you expect this nitrogen to be electron donating or withdrawing by induction? Um, I think it to be electron withdrawing. Not very, not as strong as an oxygen, but slightly. It's further to the right on the periodic table. Slightly more electronegative than carbon. Good. Okay, that's right. So normally we would expect nitrogen to be electron withdrawing by induction. Um, but what's, who's going to, um, so those two are in conflict with each other, so who's more important, the induction or the resonance? The resonance. Right. In fact, since resonance usually trumps induction, maybe we don't even have to bother thinking about the induction when there's resonance. Maybe it just complicates things. So uh, maybe it's better just to ignore induction when there's resonance, because okay. resonance um, is usually going to be more important. Okay, good. Let's uh, copy this onto your screen. What role would we expect now for the benzene? It looks like this would be electron withdrawing by resonance and would actually leave um, the ortho and para carbons in the benzene ring to be. Um, electrophilic. So I'll go ahead and draw that. And perhaps even that carbonyl carbon as well. Forgot to write that arrow.
Okay. Okay. And you already kind of analyzed the reactivity here. The answer you gave was a good one. Now, it turns out that in this case, this molecule still does not have the prerequisites. So it looks like you were predicting that this would now act like a electrophile. That was a good prediction in theory. It turns out that this still does not really have the prerequisites for this benzene to act like an electrophile, despite the positive charge. That would be hard to predict just from theory. It turns out in practice, this still doesn't have the prerequisites that are necessary to act like an electrophile. So let's continue to assume that the benzene will act like a nucleophile. Let's continue to assume that the benzene will act like a nucleophile. Is it going to be a better or worse nucleophile than without this substituent? Worse. So would we say that this substituent activated the benzene as a nucleophile or deactivated it as a nucleophile? Deactivated it. So compared to the previous substituents, this would be considered a deactivator. Um, okay, good. If, um, but re I don't know if you remember, but this is a reaction that we saw. These reactions with benzene generally require Lewis acid catalysts in any case. We saw earlier uh, in previous sessions, these reactions generally require Lewis acid catalysts. So with the right catalyst, we can still get this reaction to occur. We just, uh, basically, we just need a, 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 a very good electrophile to react with this, and the benzene could still be a nucleophile. Um, which, which carbons in the benzene would you expect to be nucleophilic? So if you just trust me, if we just assume that the benzene will be nucleophilic, if we assume the benzene will be nucleophilic, which carbons would we expect to be nucleophilic? Um, the meta, five and seven, carbons. And why is that? Um, because they do not have hidden positive charges. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. That's right. So that's what I was going for uh, in this case. Um, so in this case, actually, this reaction, although it, you might not have predicted it from theory, this reaction will still have the, nu uh, the benzene acting like a nucleophile. And which carbons will be nucleophilic? Carbons five and seven. Not because medic. they're great nucleophiles, but they're just less bad than the ortho and the para. So this is yeah. not a situation of being good, but of being less bad. No one's great here, but five and seven are less bad as nucleophiles because at least they don't have the positive charge. Okay, um, okay good. Usually we assume that the atom with the charge is the one that's going to react. But this is a case where actually the atom without the charge is less bad uh, for the particular reaction that we're looking at. Okay, so let's go back to my screen and try to summarize this. So what did we decide? Did this substituent activate or deactivate the benzene as a nucleophile? Deactivated it. So this would be called a deactivator for this re reaction. This deactivated the benzene. act as a nucleophile. But if we assume the benzene will still nevertheless act like a nucleophile, which carbons will act, uh, act like that? Will this be an ortho para or a meta director? Um, if they were to still act as a nucleophile, yes. meta director. the benzene to act like a nucleophile. Okay, good. Okay, good. So you might want to compare. Remember you'd asked me the question earlier when we saw this example, you asked, is oxygen always an electron donor? Because with this example we saw the oxygen was an electron donor. Um, well, here's another answer to that. Here's a case where the oxygen was an electron withdrawer. Um, by both induction and resonance. The oxygen here is an electron withdrawer by both induction and resonance. But since resonance is more important, maybe that's the, the, the one that to especially focus on here. So the oxygen here is an electron withdrawer by both induction and resonance. Whereas here, the resonance made the oxygen an electron donor. Notice okay. there's a big difference between the oxygen being connected to the ring and here the oxygen being connected to the atom that's connected to the ring. That turns out to make a big difference. That's why I said, depending on the molecule's structure, oxygens can be either electron donating or withdrawing by resonance. In fact, this is an example you were already thinking of on your own. When I asked you to think about this earlier, you were already thinking about carbonyls 
and you were already thinking on your own about how car in carbonyls oxygens are electron withdrawing. So uh, you had already predicted this, and here we can see that example. Okay, good. Let's copy this molecule onto your screen. Uh, so what reactivity would we predict here? Hmm, trying to remember. If I were to draw this out, it seems like nitrogen has a positive charge. That's great that you remember the Lewis structure. I told you it would be good to memorize that. That's not an obvious structure, so that's good that you remember that. You remember the two charges in that. Do you remember what the name of this functional group is? A nitro group? That's great that you remember the Lewis structure for the nitro group. So that's a good start. Um, thanks. Boy, it, it almost looks like it could work either way. <laughs> um, no, actually it wouldn't work either way. It looks like it's like two, four, and six would become less nucleophilic. I think that's all that really will predict the reactivity of it. That's a good point. And so it, it looks like it is a deactivator. This deactivates benzene um, and would be a meta director. Great. Good. Just to clarify, are you assuming here that the benzene will act like a nucleophile or an electrophile? Um, I'm assuming it would act as a nucleophile. Now, you might not expect that in theory with the positive charges, but that's what we did in the previous example. If we continue to assume that the benzene will act like a nucleophile, then you're right, it's going to be deactivated as a nucleophile. So your answer was correct. Your answer was correct this nitro group is deactivating the benzene to act like a nucleophile. Um, but if it does act like a nucleophile, um, it would be the meta position. That would be nucleophilic, and why is that? Because that is less bad. It um, right. does not have anything to be positive. Yeah, well put, because that's the less bad position. Everybody's bad here as a nucleophile, but the meta position is the least bad because it doesn't actually have a resonant structure with a positive charge. Okay, very good. Excellent. Maybe let's scroll up so we can see this example and the previous example at the same time. So both of these were similar. Both these substituents had the same effect. They were both deactivators. They were both meta directors for the benzene to act like a nucleophile. In which case, which of these do you we expect to be the stronger deactivator? 
well, the nitro group is withdrawing by resonance, also by induction. What um, do you expect the nitrogen to be electron donating or withdrawing by induction? Do you expect the nitrogen to be electron donating or withdrawing by induction in the nitro group? Um, definitely withdrawing. And why is that? Um, it is both more electronegative and further to the right on the periodic chart. I think those last two things are the two ways of saying the same thing. Okay. Uh, we uh, good. However, we haven't quite put our finger on why this nitrogen is particularly electron withdrawing by induction in the nitro group. Hmm. I guess I'm not seeing anything beyond the the positive charge that it holds. Okay, and that's fine. You just hadn't. You actually hadn't mentioned that positive charge. Oh, okay. I, I did say it, but maybe I, it didn't come out right. Okay. Maybe you were thinking it, but you didn't say it. Okay. Yes. So, so, so then what were you trying to say? Why is the nitrogen particularly electron withdrawing more than a, uh, by induction more than a normal nitrogen? Uh, because it has a positive charge. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. Um, so, in fact, the nitro group is just about the most electron withdrawing group you can find. Nitro groups are about the most electron withdrawing groups you can find because of the strong resonance and induction effects. With the with the full, there's a full positive charge on that nitrogen. Of course, there's also some negative formal charges on the oxygens, but they're they're further away from the benzene. Um, it turns out they're much less important because they're further away from the benzene. What turns out to be most important is the positive charge that's right next to the benzene plus the, the resonance. So nitro groups are particularly important as very strong electron withdrawers. Nitro groups are particularly important as very strong electron withdrawers. All right, so I'll go back to my screen. So we decided this nitro group also deactivates the benzene to act as a nucleophile. So for that reaction, it's a meta director. So was this nitrogen electron donating or withdrawing? Um, that was donating. By resonance. And how about this nitrogen? And that's withdrawing by resonance right. and induction. So, notice, just like oxygens can play different roles, so can nitrogens. Does this nitrogen have a lone pair? Yeah. Does this nitrogen have a lone pair? No. That's one of the key differences between them. That's why I said it would be good to memorize the Lewis structure for a nitro group, because it's not obvious just from looking at the condensed notation that this has no lone pair. Just looking at the condensed notation doesn't make it obvious that nitrogen has no lone pair, but if you have memorized the Lewis structure, you can see that it doesn't. Also, this doesn't make it obvious that the nitrogen has a positive formal charge. That's why it's worth memorizing that. So there can be a big difference between different nitrogens. So again, this is a big success for the, the theory of resonance. As I think I mentioned to you before, it's kind of amazing that we can just draw these silly little pictures on paper and they actually predict how the molecules actually react. Uh, well, this definitely works. The, this NH2 group molecule has a huge, reacts hugely differently than with the NO2. Um, and we can and we can predict and explain that using our pictures on paper of uh, resonance. So this is a successful theory for explaining that. Um, okay, so uh, good. So it's important to compare those. Let's see. So all of the reactions we've looked at so far, we've been considering. Let's actually do this. What role might we expect carbon-1 to play in a reaction? What role might we expect carbon-1 to play in a reaction? Um, Based on the earlier rules that we talked about earlier. Electrophile. 
why would that be reasonable? Because chlorine makes a good leaving group. That's a, that's, that is a good answer. There's something else that, uh, that we should also mention. Why else would carbon-1 be a reasonable electrophile using what we talked about earlier? Um, a, a delta positive from the chlorine's induction. Okay, that's right. Yeah, so that, that was the other thing I was hoping that you would say there. Your first answer was correct, but it's also really important to look for those delta positives. That's something I think we've had a little trouble with in the past. Remember that if you can't see a full formal positive charge, you look for a delta positive. I think sometimes we're still having a little trouble looking for those delta positives. Okay, so because of the delta positive, we might expect carbon-1 to be electrophilic. Um, however, remember that generally benzene is a generally highly stable molecule. Um, so this is not going to be a good enough electrophile to actually get a reaction. We're not actually going to get any particular reaction here. But let's say that we wanted to actually make carbon-1 now electrophilic. So notice that now we're, we're shifting gears. Now we're shifting gears. Previously, we've been assuming the benzene would act like a nucleophile. Previously, we've been assuming the benzene would act as a nucleophile. Now let's try to make the benzene act as an electrophile. Seems like in the past when we wanted something to be more electrophilic, you would add an acid? That would be a good idea, yes. Something we've often done in the past is adding an acid. So that's an excellent idea. That turns out not to be what the route we're going to take here, but that was a good guess. Instead, let's just ask what other substituent could we put on the ring that would make uh, the benzene more electrophilic. So let's say we're going to add another substituent to the ring. What type of substituent would we want to add to the ring to make the benzene more electrophilic? An um, electron withdrawing. That's right. We want to add another electron withdrawing group. Great. Well, what group? what's maybe one of the most electron withdrawing groups we could add? Nitro group? Yeah, we just finished saying nitro groups are the most electron withdrawing. So let's add a nitro group. So if we add a nitro group, it's possible to make the benzene electrophilic if we keep the chlorine. So actually, we, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to make carbon-1 electrophilic. We're trying to make carbon-1 electrophilic because that's the one that has the leaving group. This will act like a leaving group. That was a good insight that you had. There's one more question that we need to ask, though. Where should we add the nitro group? Should we add the nitro group in the ortho, meta, or para positions? in order to make carbon-1 electrophilic. Um, I was saying para, and not, not yeah, the para position would work. Um, maybe even the ortho position. Um, I think you that right. So let's yeah. draw that on your screen. Let's go ahead and draw that on your screen. Good. Now, remember, now our goal is not to draw all the possible resonance structures, but to focus on particular resonance structures that are interesting for reactivity. Okay. Good. So, yeah, you can put, the, uh, you can put a bunch of arrows together to do that. All right. Just to uh, save us a little time, too. Very good. 
Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, does that confirm that the para position is a good or a bad place to put this nitro group? A good place if you want one to be electrophilic. If you want carbon one to be electrophilic. Excellent. I think that's what you're already figuring out in your head. So, excellent. Great. Um, are there any other positions we could put the nitro group? Um, yeah. That would if make carbon one electrophilic. If you were to put it in the ortho position right next to the chlorine, like uh, attached to either carbon two or carbon six, that would also work. Maybe I drew those rings. Um, is it fair to switch the position of those bonds, knowing that you, that's fine? Okay. I think that would also give you a a strong electrophile out of that first carbon. Okay, so why is the ortho position a good place to put the nitro group if we want to make carbon one electrophilic? Um, it will also, through resonance, withdraw electron density so that it um, leaves that first carbon with the positive charge. Good. So that last thing you said was the key. It's because there's a resonance structure where carbon one has a positive formal charge. Good. Okay. Um, you know, so that's good. Since since our one of our main goals here is to practice resonance, why don't we go back to the thing that was giving you pause a second ago? Let's draw the ring now with the double bonds in the position they were originally. Maybe let's draw that off to the side. Uh, let's draw what it would look like if the double bonds were in the position they were originally before you erased them, and the nitro group okay. still is in the ortho position, just so we can practice how to deal with that. I guess you could draw multiple arrows. Yeah. Nope, not like that. We had them that way. Let's try to draw the resonance structure that puts the positive charge on the chlorine using this starting position. Okay. Great, we can just stop right there. That would give you the same exact picture you have uh, above and to the right. So it's not necessary. It's not like you're, you're dead meat if you start with the double bonds in the wrong position. You can always adjust to it. Uh, here we had to put a whole bunch of arrows in at the same time, but there was a way still to get the positive charge there in one step. Okay, good. Um, okay, I just wanted to point that out. Maybe to avoid having extra resonance structures, we can erase that now. I think you, you get the idea. So we can okay. erase that now. I just wanted to point that out for practice with resonance. Okay. All right. Now, <laughs> how about if we put the nitro group in the meta position? Would that be as effective at making carbon-1 electrophilic? No, no, it wouldn't. wouldn't Let's because you can show that. Okay, okay. So let's try to show why the nitro group is not as effective if it's in the meta position.
Looks like the positive charge would pass right over that carbon one. Good, exactly. So there's the nitro group is not effective here because there's no resonance structure where the positive charge is on carbon one. So in fact, yeah. if you put the nitro group in the meta position, the benzene would not act like an electrophile. This is a pretty delicate reaction that needs a lot of things to come together. If the nitro group's in the meta position, that's not good enough to get the, uh, to get the benzene to act like an electrophile. So you might want to make a note that those resonant structures show why the nitro is not effective at making carbon-1 electrophilic in the meta position. Okay, so let's go back to my screen. So if we want the uh, if we want uh, benzene to act like a nucleophile, if we want the benzene to act like an electrophile, if we want the benzene to act like an electrophile. Does the nitro group activate or deactivate the benzene to act like an electrophile? Does the nitro group activate or be deactivate the benzene to act like an electrophile? It activates it to act as an electrophile. And when is the nitro group most effective at that? In the ortho, para, or meta positions? Um, in the ortho or para positions relative to the other substituent, the, the halide, halogen. Okay, so it would be interesting to compare these two examples. I can think, I can see how a student might easily start to get confused here. Here we said the benzene was deactivating, and here we said the benzene, uh, I'm sorry, here we said the nitro was deactivating. And here we say the nitro is activating. Isn't that a contradiction? How can the nitro group activate and deactivate? Well, it's because in this example, we were looking at the benzene as a nucleophile. Nitro deactivates the benzene as a nucleophile. But in this example, we were looking at the benzene as an electrophile. Nitro activates the benzene as an electrophile. That's why I was saying earlier that you don't want to be lazy and take shortcuts here. You don't want to just say it's an activator or a deactivator unless you firmly know in your mind what reaction you're talking about. So for our purposes, it was better to say the whole sentence. Nitro deactivates benzene as a nucleophile and activates benzene as an electrophile. Uh, the effect of the substituent depends on the reaction you want. Also, here we said the nitro was a meta director, but here we said it was more effective in the ortho and para positions. That might seem like a contradiction again, but there's no contradiction because the benzene was playing a different role in the two cases. If you want the benzene to act like a nucleophile, the nitro um, is uh, going to make the meta positions more reactive. But if you want the benzene to act like an electrophile, the nitro group is going to make the ortho or para positions more reactive. Uh, okay, so we're starting to see how we can uh, put a bunch of different things together to make uh, predictions here. Good. Um, also, why do we notice that ortho usually seems to go with para? And we can yeah. see why. Why does ortho usually fall in the same class as para? Because they tend to have the same resonance structures. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, so just to summarize this, uh, I've been kind of—I haven't been giving you the name of this reaction, but if benzene acts like a nucleophile, when benzene acts like a nucleophile, what would be a good name for this uh, reaction? Let's try to come up with this. Let's go back up to our original reaction here. So here we wanted uh, the benzene here to uh, act. We're talking about benzene acting as a nucleophile. Mm -hmm. Well, remember we said that benzene has a special property called being aromatic. Yeah. So that's part of the name of this reaction. Now, 
if the benzene is acting like a nucleophile, what role would the other molecule play? I haven't told you who the other molecule is, but if the benzene is acting like a nucleophile, what role would the other molecule play? Electrophile. So the reaction we've been discussing here is one that's, we started by talking about something that's called electrophilic aromatic substitution. When benzene acts like a nucleophile, that reaction is called uh, aromatic electrophilic substitution. We actually looked at those reactions earlier in previous sessions. We saw how they needed Lewis acid catalysts usually to work. Um, th notice this is a little counterintuitive. When the benzene is acting like a nucleophile, the name of the reaction is electrophilic substitution because it's, the benzene will act with an electrophile. The aromatic refers to the benzene, and then the electrophile is the other molecule. Uh, so to repeat, this is a little confusing. When the benzene acts like a nucleophile, the other molecule is electrophilic. So that's called aromatic electrophilic substitution. Okay. So for example, here, we were talking about how nitro group deactivates benzene as a nucleophile. Well, if the benzene was gonna act like a nucleophile, that would be called again. Actually, I misremembered. It's called electrophilic aromatic substitution. Just reversing the words. Okay. When benzene acts like a nucleophile, because then the other molecule is electrophilic. So again, here's an example. If benzene is acting like a nucleophile, that would be electrophilic aromatic substitution whereas remember that here we were discussing benzene acting like an electrophile well if the benzene is acting like an electrophile what role would the other molecule play nucleophile so that's called nucleophilic aromatic substitution. So we saw that nitro deactivates electrophilic benzene for electrophilic aromatic substitution, but the nitro group activates benzene for nucleophilic aromatic substitution. In electrophilic aromatic substitution, the nitro group makes the meta position more likely to react. But in nucleophilic aromatic substitution, the nitro group makes the, uh, the nitro group makes the ortho and para positions more likely to react. Okay. Again, I uh, just wanted to point out a slightly confusing terminology. When the benzene acts like a nucleophile, the reaction is called electrophilic because the other molecule is electrophilic. And when the benzene acts like an electrophile, the reaction is called nucleophilic aromatic substitution because the other molecule that we haven't been showing would be nucleophilic. I haven't been going through the full reaction here. I've just been focusing on the benzene. Uh, but we did do some examples of electrophilic aromatic substitution in some earlier sessions. Okay, so let's see. Okay, um, electrophilic aromatic substitution is one of the most important topics in the second semester. So probably pretty early in the second semester, you'll be spending a lot of time studying electrophilic aromatic substitution. And one of the main things you cover is whether uh, substituents are activators or deactivators, and whether they're ortho, para, or meta directors. So almost all the examples here we did were electrophilic aromatic substitution. Almost all the examples were for electrophilic aromatic substitution. Um, nucleophilic aromatic substitution, some classes cover that and some don't. So I don't know whether your course is gonna cover this one or not. Some courses cover nucleophilic aromatic substitution, some courses don't, so I just showed one example. So here at the end, we did one example of nucleophilic aromatic substitution, which may or may not be covered in your course. Uh, but your course will definitely focus on this electrophilic aromatic substitution. So I think we did four different examples of that. We saw that this group was an ortho para uh, director and an activator for electrophilic aromatic substitution. This group was an ortho para director and an activator for electrophilic aromatic substitution. This group was a deactivator and a meta director for electrophilic aromatic substitution, and the nitro group was a meta director and a deactivator for electrophilic aromatic substitution. That's a key topic in the second semester. And then we briefly looked at nucleophilic aromatic substitution, which you might cover uh, in your course, and we saw that things basically reverse in that case. 
Uh, okay. All right. So anyway, now we're seeing um, how. Uh, so basically, we got a head start on one of the most imp more important topics in the second semester, which is electrophilic aromatic substitution. Uh, that was the main uh, thing for us to look at here. Okay. Let's see. If there's a conflict between resonance and induction, who usually wins? Resonance. Good. Maybe I should uh, give you one exception to that. There's always an exception. Um, Here's our exception. Resonance is less important than induction for halogens. Okay, okay. Maybe I'll briefly explain why that is. Um, resonance is less important because resonance um, is less significant when the two atoms have a big size difference. It turns out that reson it, it's hard to have resonance between two atoms that have a big difference in size. Well, do, I don't know if you remember, you have your periodic table close to you. Which row of the periodic table is carbon in and which row is chlorine in? Um, carbon in the second, chlorine is in the third row. So who's bigger? Chlorine. In fact, chlorine is a lot bigger because it has a whole extra shell, sh extra shell of electrons. Because of that, this resonance structure is less important. This resonance structure tends to be less important because there's a big size difference between the chlorine and the carbon. Resonance actually occurs because of an overlap of orbitals, overlap of p orbitals, so that we haven't talked about that very much. But the orbitals can't overlap very effectively when there's a big size difference. Um, okay, so resonance would be less important for chlorine, and obviously that would be even more of a factor for bromine or iodine, right? Bromine and iodine are much bigger than carbon. Okay, yeah. Uh, and maybe we'll briefly talk about fluorine. Fluorine doesn't come up much in organic chemistry. Fluorine doesn't come up much in organic chemistry, but this would still work even for fluorine. Actually, now, fluorine is this in the same row as carbon. Fluorine is in the same row as carbon, but even for fluorine, resonance is less important than induction for a different reason. Uh, because I don't know, do you know who's the most electronegative element in the periodic table? Fluorine. So, fl even though fluorine is the same size as carbon, fluorine is so electronegative that its induction is also more important than resonance. Uh, so fluorine doesn't come up too much in organic chemistry, but this is something that's true for all the halogens. Chlorine, bromine, and iodine are too big to have very effective resonance, and fluorine is so electronegative that its induction is more important than usual. Okay, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that, but it would be good to have in your notes that um, when you study electrophilic aromatic substitution, did you, did you kind of notice that we studied two cases um, for electrophilic aromatic substitution? We saw that some of the things in electrophilic aromatic substitution were activators and orthopara directors, like this OH group or this NH2. And the other two things we saw were meta directors and deactivators, like this group and this group. But it turns out that halogens are a whole third case. Halogens are just a whole third special case for electrophilic aromatic substitution. They don't follow the same rules as before. And one of the main reasons for that is because resonance is less important for them. So I'm, I'm not going to go into the, de the details of that right now. I'll just mention that halogens often are uh, a special case. Resonance is less important for halogens because uh, uh, the, the key halogens like chlorine, bromine, and iodine are much bigger than, than uh, carbon. Okay, so we'll just put that in your notes. Okay. So um, that's a, a key topic in the second semester. We got a head start on that. That's one of the things you'll focus on uh, in the second semester for benzene. So let's continue uh, talking about this. One thing that's interesting is, you know, last time we talked about some 
roles that residents played in the first semester. But we didn't actually mention that many. The only roles that residents that we saw that residents played in the first semester were things like why hydrogen sulfate is unreactive and why sulfonates are good leaving groups. And that was pretty much it. Um, almost all the other topics for residents are in the second semester, which is one reason why I wanted to go over this with you. It's a little bit unfortunate because what happens is people study resonance, people learn how to draw resonance structures at the beginning of the first semester, but then they don't really use it at all until the second semester, by which point they've completely forgotten it if they ever learned it in the first place. So you usually, you usually learn how to draw resonance in the first semester, but then you don't really use it intensively until the second semester. So anyway, um, since we're getting ready for your second semester, that's one reason why we're focusing on resonance here. Um, that uh, resonance is one of the key themes in the second semester, but it only comes up in a couple issues for the first semester. So one of the key, um, we already saw last time that one of the key places that resonance comes up in the second semester is conjugated molecules. Yeah. With electrophilic uh, that uh, act as, that, uh, that get uh, attacked by electrophiles. We went over that last time. Uh, another key topic in the second semester is benzene. So we just went over that. Uh, let's look at, say, this. Let's go to your screen and try to predict what's going to happen in this reaction. Let's write, write some electron pushing arrows for this on your screen. Hmm. Not sure that I can see anything else that would happen here. Um. And unless you... Not sure that this would... And is what you're drawing now resonance or a reaction? Reaction. Good, but I think you drew a resonance arrow. You drew a double-headed arrow. 
Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Didn't notice that. Okay, so what role would carbon-3 be playing in this reaction? Electrophile. And why is that reasonable? It's attached to oxygen with a positive charge. Okay, okay, good. That's right. Um, we know that when you're attached to an atom with a positive charge, that generally makes you electrophilic. So you seem to have quite a bit of doubt about this reaction. You came up with something that was pretty reasonable. Now, we have seen that it, um, it turns out in the past, sometimes the leaving group falls off without being pushed. I haven't tried to teach you the rules for that, though. So what you wrote down actually was, seems pretty reasonable, but it turns out it's not what actually happens in this case. What, um, but what you wrote down is, is quite reasonable. It turns out what actually happens is that the leaving group just falls off. That would have been hard to predict, so I wouldn't expect you to predict that. What you wrote down was reasonable. It just didn't turn out to be uh, correct. Um, so let's go back and change those arrows. Let's just show the leaving group just falling off without being pushed. Um, okay, would that be reasonable, though, with it being only a primary carbon there? That's a good question. So let's try to work out whether that is reasonable or not. Like that. Okay, yes. So you tell me, is that an allowable carbocation or forbidden? Um, I think it's forbidden. It doesn't have any resonance to stabilize that primary carbocation. Okay. Um, let's see. So, yeah. So, um, is there, are there any resonance structures here? Mm, no. Any particular reason why you say no? Um, I don't see any um, pi bonds to... Huh. Well, I, okay. There is a lone pair there. Usually, I guess I've been looking for the pi bonds. I suppose you actually could. Have that as resonance. Yeah, I, I overlooked that. Okay, so it's good that you were looking for resonance. We did seem to be missing it. Now, I'm not quite sure why we're missing it here, because this does fall into the patterns we talked about before. Remember, we talked yeah. about six patterns. So this is the pattern of a lone pair on an atom that's connected to a carbon with a positive charge. So this does fall exactly into one of those patterns um, that, we've, uh, that we've seen before. For some reason, we just had a mental block on this particular case. I think you said you were looking for pi bonds. Um, maybe because the previous examples with benzenes involved pi bonds. The previous examples with benzenes and the examples we finished with last time. Most of the examples we've been doing maybe involved pi bonds. So maybe we started for, to forget about the patterns with lone pairs. But remember, there's also um, a couple of different patterns where we have a lone pair at the beginning of the resonance arrow. So that's important not to forget. Okay, so that's important to review here. So is this a reasonable uh, carbocation? Yeah. Yeah, it's just fine to be primary if your resonance stabilized. Why is this considered a primary carbocation? Um, carbon-3 is only attached to one other carbon. Yeah. Primary doesn't refer to how many things you're attached to. It refers to how many carbons you're attached to. So it is primary but it's a reasonable primary carbocation because of the resonance. Um, okay, so we, uh, we had a little trouble with that one. We were missing that. So in this case, you, you couldn't have predicted that the OH would just fall off. You couldn't predict that, but you can see that, it, that it's reasonable because it leaves behind a reasonable carbocation. Okay, um, does it look like we're done, or does it, this reaction look like it needs another step? Mm, needs a, another step. Let's see if we can come up with a reasonable next step. Um.
Okay. Okay. Uh, so, um, is your uh, last step resonance or a reaction? Huh. Yeah, I, uh, I did that twice. Actually, the last two steps we got, yeah. I can see how you could get confused because there was some resonance. Um, yeah. There was resonance. We can't, Now we're starting mixing up resonance and reaction. So here's actually where it's more useful to have two different types of arrows. So we can show which steps are resonance and which steps are reactions. Okay. Um, the products that you drew at the end are incorrect. Double check your work for the last step. See if you can find the mistake that you made for the products you drew at the end. The arrows you drew were correct. The arrows you drew were correct, but the products you drew were incorrect. Okay, so those turned out to be uh, pretty badly off there. So remember to use the arrows to draw the products. Um, how do you know that the oxygen's new charge will be positive and not negative? The oxygen would the oxygen would be grabbing a hydrogen. And that would give it a positive charge. That's true. That's true. But um, that actually is a little overthinking it. Remember, there's very simple rules for figuring out the charges based on the arrows. That was one of the first topics we went over. Maybe we should review that briefly. Um, what's the simplest way to see what the new charge on the oxygen is going to be, just using the rules for the arrows? Um, it's at the tail. Its lone pair of electrons are at the tail of the electron pushing arrows which makes it one less step, one step um, less negative. Good. One step more positive. Good. Although that's only half of it. The other half is what charge did it start with? It started with the neutral. That's charge. right. So since it started neutral and it's losing electrons because it's at the tail, it becomes positive. The reason I'm emphasizing that is we want, we, uh, we want to see that this requires very little thought to figure out the charges. Um, we should be able to do that somewhat mechanically. I'll just remind you of that on my screen again. Remember, these were the rules that we w went over when we first started working together. You make the atom that's losing electrons at the start of the chain of arrows one step less negative. You make the atom that's gaining electrons at the end of the chain of arrows one step more negative. You just ask yourself, what formal charge did the atom start with, and is it gaining or losing electrons, which is easy to tell by looking to see whether it's at the start or the end of the arrows. There's almost no thought that's involved. We can do that quite mechanically. Um, so that's important to keep remembering. I'll go back to your screen. Okay. So um, point to the picture where the water is attacking carbon-3. What role did carbon-3 play in that picture? Electrophile. And why is that reasonable? in that picture. Um, because it's attached to a carbon or an oxygen with a positive charge. Good. Notice that you could have justified it using either resonance structure. In the first resonance structure, the carbon had a positive formal charge, or here it's attached to an atom with a positive charge. So you could use either picture to justify this reaction. We used the resonance to explain why the primary carbocation was stabilized. Um, now, normally I, would, uh, normally I don't think it's really necessary to draw this new resonance structure because it doesn't change the reactivity. Since this resonance structure doesn't draw, change the reactivity, we might normally not even draw it. But we should know in the back of our mind that it exists, and it's the reason why the primary carbocation is, is possible. You don't always have to draw all resonance structures. We're just drawing them because that's the main thing we're focusing on right now. But we should at least know they exist. Um, so we can see why that stabilizes the carbocation. All right, remember at first we were having trouble seeing this resonance structure because you were looking for pi bonds. Remember, it's possible to form resonance without pi bonds. You can also have patterns that involve lone pairs. Um, how many charges should we change on every step of every mechanism? Two. I don't think we've shown who are the two atoms whose charges changed on the first step. Who are the two atoms whose charges change on the first step of this mechanism? Mm, we should have another... Okay, 
So that's important. Yeah. Just to, we just want to keep uh, keep maintaining good habits for that. We just want to keep maintaining those good habits. Uh, okay. Those are key skills. Okay. All right. Um, so this topic won't take us as long as the benzene did. I just wanted to point out again, um, in the first semester, you can't make primary carbocations. In the first semester, you cannot make primary carbocations. But then students are surprised to discover that in the second semester, surprise, you can make primary carbocations. Why? Well, it's okay to make a primary carbocation when it's resonance stabilized. So that'll come up in a bunch of different examples in the second semester. Primary carbocations are okay when they're resonance stabilized. That was the main point I wanted to make in that example. That reaction okay. actually continues. That reaction actually has more steps but uh, those would be hard to predict based on what we already talked about, so we'll just leave it there. Okay, so let's go back to my screen. Um, let's try to predict what reaction would occur here. Let's try that on your screen. Let's try to predict the reaction that would occur here on your screen. Go back to my screen for a moment. Okay. Let me add this. And let's try uh, just making this small change to the molecule and then you can go back to your screen. Okay. Okay. I think that's what I got. Okay. Now let's back up for a second. Um, mm -hmm. So what's the most important factor in organic chemistry? In charge? The charges. <laughs> But I think you are about to stop there without getting the charge, right? So that's something that's, uh, so that's, something that's very important uh, to pay attention to. So the main thing we're focusing here on is resonance.
But this is also an important time to reinforce some of the skills we went over in the first few sessions that we went over. So, uh, so let's erase that last arrow that you put in. Uh, that actually, that's, uh, that's not a bad arrow. But um, what I wanted to make sure is just make sure we're getting the right product. This might not seem like a big deal, but if we leave that positive charge off of carbon-5, then our work is just completely mistaken. The most important factor is to get the charges right. Remember, how many charges should we change on every step of every mechanism? Two. Two. Why do I keep asking you that question? Because I'm hoping that whenever you do a mechanism, you should always make sure, did I change two charges? That's just part of what we need to do every time we draw any mechanism. Every time you're drawing a new product, you always need to change the two charges. Remember, what, what most people do is they kind of just change the charges that are obvious. They change the charges that are obvious. But you remember we've seen how when you have a neutral nucleophile, people often forget to give it a positive charge. People forget to give neutral nucleophiles a positive charge because it doesn't start with a charge. Well, that's what happened here. Because carbon-5 didn't start with a charge, you weren't thinking about its charge. So how can we get out of that and get into a better mindset? You always need to force yourself to ask yourself, um, what are the two charges that I'm changing? Every step of every mechanism and every new resonance structure, we always need to force ourselves to ask, what are the two charges uh, that we're changing? That's one of the most important things that you and I have gone over. Okay. Um, so now, uh, what role did carbon-7 play in this reaction? Carbon-7 was a nucleophile. And why did you think that was reasonable? Because of the carbon-carbon double bond, the pi bond, but also because of resonance um, with the nitrogen's lone pair. It would have revealed a hidden charge on carbon-7. So why is carbon-7 nucleophilic and not carbon-5? Because carbon-7 had the hidden negative charge while carbon-5 did not. Excellent. Okay, good. That's the key that I wanted to go over here. Um, so there's a hidden negative charge on carbon-7. And as a result, it's uh, highly nucleophilic. Or, I don't know, not highly, but it's fairly nucleophilic. That was the key, uh, key thing to look at here. Um, okay. Um, normally we would continue on with this reaction and look at the further steps. But actually, in this case, I'm not going to go into what hap uh, the further steps. Often, uh, this reaction sometimes might just stop here, um, although what you wrote down was reasonable. Now that I think about it, I'm not sure why the bromine wouldn't attack carbon-5. That's not usually uh, what we see uh, happening here, but uh, that does seem uh, fairly reasonable. But uh, let's just stop this reaction here. You can learn more about this later in the second semester. The key thing I wanted to go over was how carbon-7 was nucleophilic. Um, so let's see, how should we draw this? Because carbon-7, the thing that's making carbon-7 nucleophilic is really the lone pair on the nitrogen. Yeah. So the way this is usually drawn is, let's, um, let's draw the lone pair in on that nitrogen. Go back to, to your first picture and draw the lone pair in on the nitrogen. And now draw an arrow showing that lone pair kicking the pi bond off of carbon-5. We want to draw an arrow from the lone pair. That's right. The reaction is usually drawn like this. Oh, uh, well, now we don't need that arrow. In a way, we're kind of combining the resonance arrow and the reaction arrow in the same step. Okay. So this is the way this reaction is usually drawn, as if the carbon-7 is pushing the pi bond to attack. Um, so let's, let's change then your final picture. What would the product look like if we drew the picture like this? This is how this was usually drawn in the second semester, although the way you drew it is not wrong. The way you drew it is certainly correct. The way you drew it is certainly correct. This is just a more common way of drawing it. Uh, another way to do this is, let's go back and just redraw the original starting material down below. Let's redraw the starting material down below. Good. And now let's just draw just resonance. Let's just draw what the other resonance structure is. <clears throat> this is something that previously you were only picturing in your head. 
But now let's actually draw that other resonance structure. No, oh, I didn't write that correctly. Okay, that's important. Those little details are very crucial, because the whole reason we're doing this is to get the charges correct. Okay. Yeah. How do you know that that carbon should be negative? What's the mechanical process for figuring that out? Um, it was neutral, and then it's at receiving electrons because of the head of the electron pushing arrow landing on it. That's and right. So one step more negative. So we always have to go through that two-step process. Unfortunately, what most people do is they just kind of draw the charge that feels good. Usually what people do is they, they kind of just draw the charges that feel good. And they oftentimes they get things right because they've just seen the reaction before. Uh, but that's really not the best approach. Rather than drawing what feels good, we should always go through the same two-step process. What charge did the atom start with? And is it gaining or losing electrons? Okay. Um, and now, um, what reactivity would you now predict based on this picture? Same as before, carbon-7 is playing what role? Um, nucleophile. Okay, so let's just draw the reaction now, starting from that resonance structure. And uh, we'll just stop right here. Um, there are uh, usually the, uh, there are further steps that are involved, but uh, that's uh, not the best thing for us to go into right now. So we'll just stop with the reaction there. Good. So let's scroll up so we can compare this to the previous example. And you can see we ended up with the same exact product. Um, so which way is the correct way? Well, either of these two are correct. And even there's a third way that you drew earlier, which would also be correct. So one thing I wanted to point out here, this is something that's often frustrating to students in the second semester. Oftentimes in the second semester, even if you write your mechanism differently than the, tip, than the answer key, that doesn't mean you're wrong. Notice how you could easily have written your mechanism like on top, and the answer key might have written it like on the bottom, but that mean, wouldn't mean that you're wrong. Because resonance plays such a major role in the second semester, there are uh, multiple correct answers to many mechanisms because resonance plays a big role in the second semester, there's multiple correct mechanisms. Um, it's always correct to use any significant resonance structure in your mechanism. It's always correct to use any significant resonance structure in your mechanism. So just because your picture looks different than the answer key doesn't mean you're wrong. You might just be uh, using a different, uh, approaching the resonance in a different way. So these are both uh, correct ways to do this. The way that's usually done is the first picture. The first picture is the way this is usually done. Um, but at first it's good to look at the second picture because it explains the reactivity. The second picture explains why carbon-7 is nucleophilic because it has a negative charge in that resonance structure. Okay. okay, so that's good that you saw that. Um, we have seen a couple examples here where I think we were getting a little sloppy with the charges, so we have to keep being uh, ultra careful about that. The charges are the key to all our predictions, so we always want to be very systematic about that. But you did correctly predict, um, you did figure out the reactivity here correctly. So um, that was good. Um, let's go back to my screen. So to review, this reaction is usually written like this, so that you don't really see the resonance. But you need to know in the back of your mind, the, one, the reason that carbon-3 is especially nucleophilic here is because there is a resonance structure where it has a negative charge. You don't necessarily have to draw that, but we should know that it exists. Okay. Now, I wanted to point out that here, there would be no reaction. You might have expected that maybe we could get something like this. But it turns out that um, this is not a good enough nucleophile and this is not a good enough electrophile for this reaction to happen. That's not something you could necessarily predict. You couldn't necessarily predict that based on what we said before. 
but it just so happens that there would be no reaction here. Okay. So how can we make this more nucleophilic? How can we make this more nucleophilic? How can we make an alkene more nucleophilic? Adding a base? One thing we talked about a lot in the past is adding a base, absolutely. We talked about how adding bases make things more nucleophilic. That wouldn't really work too well for an alkene, but in general that's a good idea. What's the new technique that we're kind of talking about today for making something more nucleophilic? Um, adding an electron donating substituent? Yeah. Of course, that kind of begs the question, because you, you, you know, you, how, how did we add it? Um, it's easy to just to draw it anyway. So we're not talking about how it's added, but the point is that if you draw it with an extra electron donating substituent, then that makes it more nucleophilic. So that's a new way to make things more nucleophilic. In the past, we said we could make something more nucleophilic by adding a base. But another good technique for making things more nucleophilic is adding an electron donating substituent. So this was an electron donating substituent here by resonance um, in this case. So would we say that the nitrogen activated or deactivated the alkene? Um, activated it to act as a nucleophile. That was a good way to put it. It activated it to act like a nucleophile. An electron donating substituent activates the alkene to act like a nucleophile. Okay, so this is a molecule that again is studied in the second semester. Uh, you didn't see this in the first semester, but putting a nitrogen, in the first semester you just study regular alkenes, but then in the second semester you study what happens if you put something next to the alkene like this, and that turns out to make it more nucleophilic so you can get reactions that you otherwise couldn't get with a regular alkene. Okay. And, and you, you basically already were figuring that out, so that's good. Let's draw this molecule on your screen. Okay. What reactivity would you predict for this molecule? Um, an electrophile, not electrophile, sorry, um, but a nucleophile, you could have some resonance here that reveals a hidden positive charge on the oxygen to make it acidic. That's a good point. Or um, a hidden negative charge on carbon-3 to make it uh, the preferred nucleophile. Excellent. It so it would activate it to behave as a nucleophile. Good. Excellent. I mean the, the alcohol group would activate mm -hmm. the oxygen. Okay, so you're all done drawing that resonance structure? Oh, yeah, um, I, I think so. <laughs> all right, I guess we weren't. Okay, so we might be getting a little sloppy on some of these and getting all these details. That's the pesky thing about organic chemistry, the details matter. So you did get the chart. Notice that even, um, actually, since you got the charges right, you were at least getting the right reactivity. The charges are more important than the bonds. But the bonds are still pretty important too, so we want to draw that bond in as well. How, uh, so just to review, how do you know there's supposed to be a bond there between the oxygen and carbon two? Um, because of the electron pushing arrows, the head of it is landing on the sigma bond between oxygen and carbon two. Okay, that's right. So why did you not draw that? Well, I don't know, but again. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't really use the arrows. What they do is they just draw what feels right. You might have just been kind of drawing what felt right, um, but it turns out that's not really very reliable. We always have to focus, uh, force ourselves to actually look at every single arrow and ask what bond are we forming and what bond are we breaking. Um, every arrow can tell us to break a bond or to form a bond or to both, if you remember the earlier work that we did. So we have to keep trying to uh, maintain those good habits. We, uh, we don't want to just draw what feels good. We have to look at each arrow carefully and ask what bonds is it asking us to break or form or both. Okay, now you did predict the reactivity here correctly. 
would we expect the oxygen to be nucleophilic? Would we expect this oxygen to be nucleophilic? No. It has a lone pair, so why would it be nucleophilic? Um, because it has a hidden positive charge through resonance. So that's al another thing that's very interesting here. Normally we would expect alcohols to be nucleophilic, but this alcohol is not nucleophilic. Uh, so again, the resonance gives us so the resonance gives us some new reactivity that we might not have expected here. Okay, so um, we made that careless mistake drawing the resonance structure, but you did predict the reactivity correctly. Let's go back to my screen. So, mm -hmm. quick question on that. The positive charge... Yes. Um, we learned before that molecules with a positive charge typically are strong acids. Yes. Um, would this still hold to that category of being a strong acid, even though it's only one of two resonance structures? Um, that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. Technically, it's not a strong acid. Technically, no. Technically, okay. no, it's not um, a strong acid. Uh, let's see. What was I wanting to say? But it certainly is much stronger than if there was no positive formal charge in any of the pictures. Okay, yeah. Uh, it might be a little bit of a borderline case. It might be a little bit of a borderline case. Uh, but t it's, it's not a fully strong acid like there would be because the positive charge is resonance stabilized. So that okay. is a very good question. It's not a full uh, strong acid because uh, the positive charge is resonance stabilized. But it certainly is a stronger acid than if there was no resonance structure with the positive charge. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a borderline case. Uh, Okay, so th that was a that was a good question. I guess that's the best answer I could give to that. Uh, but that's good that you were thinking about that. Okay, so going back to my screen, this is an important molecule in the second semester. This is called an enol. Do you see why is this a logical name? What does that name refer to? Where did that name come from? Um, it almost looks like. Ene from alkene and all from alcohol. Precisely. That's exactly what it means. Yes. It's called an enol. The ene refers to the alkene and the ol refers to the alcohol. So what role do enols play in reactions? Um, it's like either nucleophile or an acid. Okay. Good. Yes. That's right. Um, so the particular reaction that's most interesting is that enols can act like nucleophiles, although there are some reactions where uh, there is a reaction or two where it would act like an acid. But in particular, enols can act like nucleophiles. Um, it's only on carbon-3. That's so. right. Now, I haven't shown you who the enol would react with. Now, we don't usually draw the resonance structure of the enol. Draw the original enol again down below. The neutral form. Now I haven't shown you who it's going to react with, but show what the electron pushing arrows would look like for this enol to act like a nucleophile. Excellent. We don't know who goes at the head there. That's great. Notice how this is similar to the previous example. Normally we don't even bother drawing the resonance structures. We just draw the enol acting like a nucleophile. We just show the lone pair coming down to push the pi bond off. We just should know in the back of our head that the reason why this is reasonable is because there's a resonance structure where there's a hidden negative charge on carbon-3. Uh, great. So I'll go back to my screen. So these arrows here ended up being very similar to these arrows. These arrows turned out to be similar to these. Okay. Good. So, um, so basically what we're doing here is we've gone over enough material. We, we've kind of gone over a lot of the basic general rules of thumb that I wanted to go over with you. So now I'm just trying to get a head start on some of the material you're going to be covering in the second semester. And I'm especially trying to tie that into the stuff we've talked about. So one of the key topics in the second semester is benzene, especially this electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction. Um, so we spent most of today 
um, on how substituents affect benzene as a nucleophile. We saw whether they can activate or deactivate benzene as a nucleophile and whether they would be ortho or para, ortho para or meta directors uh, for that. Um, we went over this very important idea that um, in the first semester, whether something is electron donating or withdrawing usually just depends on its electronegativ electronegativity. That's the induction effect. But in the second semester, that's oftentimes uh, trumped by the resonance effect. Resonance is usually more important than induction when there's a conflict. So that was one of the key things we saw, although I did mention there is an exception. Resonance is usually not too important for halogens, um, but because uh, they tend to be bigger than the atoms that they're connected to. But otherwise, resonance can usually beat uh, induction. So um, that was one of the most important topics we went over today. Like I said, that's just a head start on something that's very important in the second semester. The concepts of activator and deactivator and orthopara and meta director are one of the key topics. Um, so we were just getting a head start on that. Um, I briefly mentioned this other reaction, nucleophilic aromatic substitution. We didn't spend as much time on that because I don't know whether your instructor is going to cover that or not. Some classes cover that and some don't. But the interesting thing here is that we saw whether something is an activator or a deactivator depends on the reaction you're considering. Something that activates you as a nucleophile would deactivate you as an electrophile. So uh, it's important to be clear about that. Um, and, we did, and then these other examples that we did uh, were less, uh, less complicated, but these were some other uh, assorted examples that come up in the second semester. Enols are an important type of molecule in the second semester, and we saw how using resonance, we can use resonance to predict the reactivity of uh, the enol. Uh, and also, uh, we, it's important to see that primary carbocations occur in the second semester because they can be stabilized uh, if, when, they're stabilized by resonance. Okay, good. Okay, good. So I think we've been making some good progress. Uh, we've been making uh, some good progress on that. Um, you do want to keep in mind that uh, as you go forward, you want to keep applying uh, the ideas and the rules that we went over in our earlier sessions about just the basic rules for drawing resonance structures and products. It's just important to, uh, to keep being careful to avoid careless mistakes, to always get the correct charges and to always get the correct bonds. This is like, uh, it's like mathematics. No matter how much math you've done, you always have to be vigilant to avoid careless mistakes. They can always start creeping in. Uh, so the same way here, we always have to be vigilant to avoid careless mistakes in our bonds or, uh, or our charges because uh, one little mistake can, uh, can mess up uh, all of our work. But I think we, uh, I think we still under understand those ideas uh, conceptually. We just have to watch out for those problems. Remember, the mistake to fall into is kind of drawing what you remember having seen or drawing what you expect to see or drawing what feels good. Um, Sometimes that works, but oftentimes that doesn't. Instead of drawing what feels good or what you remember or what you expect, you have to draw what the rules tell you to expect. So just to remind you, here are the concrete rules. Each arrow tells you whether to break a bond, whether to form a bond, or both, and you're always told exactly which two charges to change. If We, al we always want to force ourselves to follow those rules rather than drawing kind of what we expect or what, what feels correct. Uh, and also something to keep in mind, um, it's always a good idea maybe to keep spot checking yourself. Um, we've been meeting for quite a while now, so one thing you might do is go back and maybe redo some of the questions from some of the earlier homework assignments. Not, okay. not, I don't think you've forgotten them conceptually, but just to keep reinforcing those ideas. The really hard part in or organic chemistry is not learning the material, but remembering the material. It's, I'll say that again because it's so important. The hard part of OCHEM is not learning the material. None of this material is really that hard. It's moderately hard, but it's not super hard. The hard thing is there's so much material, it's really hard to keep remembering and applying it all. Yeah. So you, you have a big collection of homework problems I've sent you for the earlier sessions now. So I would definitely, um, and you should think of that as that's all stuff that you kind of paid for. So you want to make sure you're getting your money's worth out of that. You want to keep um, going back now and redoing selected problems from those earlier homework assignments to make sure that you remember conceptually and also to, remember, uh, to make sure you're practicing avoiding uh, careless mistakes uh, because it really does take continual practice otherwise people start to uh, either forget the material or at least they start to make uh, some careless mistakes.